Welcome to the uh, Richard K. Osborne Lecture for 2018. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Thomas M. Sutton, who's a consultant engineer in reactor technology and the reactor physics uh, division of the Naval Nuclear Laboratory, uh, Noel Atomic Power Laboratory, otherwise known as CAPL. And the title of his talk today is Applications of Techniques from Population Genetics and Computational Ecology to Monte Carlo Iterated Fission Source Calculations. So uh, before we start, uh, most of the uh, audience here is not old enough to remember Professor Richard Osborne, so let me tell you about him. Uh, Professor Osborne was a faculty member in this department from 1957 to 1986. And this lecture series is a tribute to honor Professor Osborne's dedication to educating students in fundamental science and is the hope that these lectures will provide a dynamic living forum for inspiring future generation of students, that's you, uh, in nuclear theory and simulations. And here's a nice picture of Professor Osborne, uh, which shows his, his usual enthusiasm that he always had. Um, I would like to acknowledge that th this Osborne Lecture Series has been endowed by a generous gift from Sidney Yip, who's Professor Emeritus at MIT. Pr professor Yip received his PhD in 1962 under the supervision of Professor Osborne. And the 1960s marked an extremely productive per period of collaboration between Professors Osborne and Yip, culminating in the publication of their classic book, The Foundations of Neutron Transport Theory. Now I'll say a few more words about our distinguished speaker, Dr. Thomas M. Sutton. Uh, he received his PhD in this department in 1983 and his master's in 1980. And before that, he uh, received his bachelor's degree uh, in nuclear engineering with highest honors from the University of Virginia in 1978. Uh, while he was at Michigan, he was a graduate student research assistant and uh, he spent a year at the University of Tokyo as a visiting researcher. And before that, he was actually a reactor operator and research assistant at University of Virginia. Uh, Tom is a fellow of the American S Physical S Nuclear Society. Uh, he's a past chair of the Mathematics and Computation Division. And uh, he very generously serves as the chair of the National Honors and Awards Committee. Uh, his current research interests, as you will find out, are Monte Carlo transport methods and stochastic neutron population dynamics. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a personal note that um, when Tom was a student here, he was involved in a uh, skit that they performed every year at our department banquet. And uh, in one of these skits, he starred as uh, Peter Plutonium. Uh, a young assistant professor just getting started, which uh, seemed an awful lot like a parody of me. But uh, uh, anyway, so uh, I'll forgive him for that. But we're, we're actually going to try to dig up that presentation at some point. Anyway, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sutton. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, everyone. Uh, can you hear OK? So it's a particular honor for me to give this lecture because uh, I was one of Dr. Osborne's students. Depending on how you count them, I was either the last or the next to the last. Sidney Yip was the first. Um, I was the last one for which Dr. Osborne was the only advisor. I think there was a person after me that he shared the advisorship with. So this is going to be kind of a different sort of talk today. Uh, most of us in the computational theoretical aspects of nuclear engineering are concentrated on figuring out how real populations of neutrons behave. And we develop computational and mathematical techniques to do that. What I'm going to be looking at today is one level removed from that. I'm going to develop a mathematical um, methodology to explain how Monte Carlo codes actually work when they're trying to simulate a real neutron population. So we're going to look at some of the peculiarities of the Monte Carlo process and some of the maybe unusual things that can happen. Um, so I'm going to start out by just giving a background of Monte Carlo iterated fission source calculations. I know everybody in this room is way smarter than me, but you might not have a background in Monte Carlo. I'll then decide, describe the very simple Monte Carlo algorithm that I use. 
and then describe two terms or two uh, concepts that come from population uh, genetics and computational biology called fixation and clustering, and then we'll draw some conclusions. Um, so I'm going to start out with a disclaimer. I gave this talk uh, in, in the fall to a bunch of people in the UK, and they said, well, you're just, you're just undersampling. You're, you're not treating the, uh, doing a real problem, and I'm not. I chose the particular algorithm and problem to emphasize this effect that I'm going to be talking about. Um, real world problems don't show the effect to the extent that I'm going to show it today, and that's on purpose. I, I meant to really exaggerate what ha could happen, but real world problems do suffer from these effects. Uh, however, just in uh, November 2016, uh, there was a paper from Oak Ridge where they showed some calculation results that they couldn't explain that were even more dramatic than the results I'm going to show today. So it can happen. What things as bad as I'm going to show today can really happen in the real world. So just some background then on Monte Carlo for neutron transport. Uh, calculations consist of a large number of simulated neutron histories. And a neutron history is just a sequence of events that occur to a single simulated neutron. The outcomes of the events are randomly sampled from known probability distribution functions using pseudo-random numbers. Uh, during the course of the history, the neutrons might do certain things that the user is interested in. In that case, we tally that result and save it till the end of the calculation. At the end of the calculation, we take the, the sums over all the simulated histories, divide by the number of histories, and that gives us the average tally result, which might be a reaction rate or a leakage rate or something like that. We typically run two types of calculations. Fixed source calculations are typically used in shielding applications. And in those calculations, the neutrons start from locations drawn by a user, from a user-specified source distribution. So we know where the source is. The user creates a little mathematical model of the source. And the neutrons start at that the source location. For reactor calculations, the situation is kind of different because uh, the neutron starting locations are drawn from the fission source distribution. But the fission source distribution depends on the neutron distribution, which is not known a priori. It must be obtained as part of the solution using some iterative process. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So the method that our Monte Carlo code at CAPL and almost all Monte Carlo codes use is called, goes by various names, but uh, one common name is the method of successive generations. So to converge on and then maintain the correct fission source distribution, uh, we run neutron history in a sequence of fission generations. Those of you who run MCNP, these are called cycles. Other codes call them batches, but it's really the same concept. So we just run 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 neutrons in a single generation. Um, we start them from some location, and we keep track of where they create fission sites. Um, for this next generation, the starting locations are drawn from the fission sites created in the preceding generation, hence the name method of successive generations. Now, to start the thing off, we need to have some initial guess. And we just call that the source guess. And for lack of better knowledge, it's often just assumed to be a uniform distribution. So for generation number one, we start all neutrons off in the uniform distribution. They create fission sites. Generation number two, we start the neutrons from the fission sites of generation number one, continue, so forth, through the generations, until we've got a converged distribution. Only when we have a converged distribution can we really start our calculation? In a deterministic calculation, once you've converged the distribution, you're finished. You've got your final answer. In a Monte Carlo calculation, only after the fission source has been converged can you start your tallies, because any tallies accumulated before the fission source converged were obtained using an incorrect source distribution, so it would give you a bad answer. That's why Monte Carlo takes so long, one of the reasons. OK, so I mentioned earlier we're going to consider the very simplest possible model. And the reason we're doing that is I want to be able to generate analytic 
equations to describe what's going on in the calculation. And I can only do that for the very simplest models. So we're going to uh, assume a homogeneous cube of a multiplying material. So it's a fissionable material and a homogeneous cube with reflecting boundary conditions. Um, the algorithm will be, it will start from a uniform initial source, source guess. And for those of you who might not have already figured it out, we're giving it the right answer to start with. You've got a homogeneous cube with reflecting boundary conditions, the right answer is a uniform solution. We're going to keep the number of neutrons per generation constant. That's almost universal of all Monte Carlo codes. We're going to use analog Monte Carlo, which means our simulated neutrons will behave just like real neutrons. In most production Monte Carlo codes like MC21, MC and P, we play all sorts of statistical tricks to minimize the variance while still getting the correct unbiased answer. We're not going to do any of those kind of tricks with this toy algorithm because that just complicates things. Now here's an important point. Um, the source sites in one generation are chosen from the absorption sites in the previous generation uniformly and with replacement. The key here is with replacement. What that means is when we're starting neutron one in some generation, it's going to be equally chosen from the N fission sources or fission sites produced in the previous generation. Uh, when we go to start neutron number two, it will also choose its starting location uniformly from the N sites from the previous generation. The fact that we chose one of those sites already for neutron number one doesn't remove it from the pool for generation num neutron number two or other neutrons in that generation. So the bottom line is some absorption sites may be used more than once and others not at all. So now I'm going to get to the first topic we're going to discuss, and that's neutron clustering. So over the years, Monte Carlo users have noticed that the density of fission sites in Monte Carlo calculations tend to exhibit a long wavelength blotchy or clumpy noise component. Uh, this has been reported on by uh, authors in France, Korea, and we've seen it at my own laboratory. Um, Maybe a decade ago, a guy wrote, uh, ran a Monte Carlo calculation for a, a full core that had quarter core symmetry. And of course, there's statistical fluctuations due to the Monte Carlo process and the pinwise uh, reaction rates. But what he saw was that the power level in each of the core, four quadrants of the core were very different. The correct solution should be, of course, that all four quadrants give exactly the same power because it's a symmetric calculation. But he would see differences much greater than what is predicted by the statistical variation alone. And it was kind of a mystery as to what happened. Uh, we think now we, we've got a handle on that. Um, so uh, other researchers in France and at MIT have, a few years ago have started to look at this issue. And they've used a continuous time model to approximate the discrete generations in, in an actual Monte Carlo calculation. So my co-author and I decided we would look at this problem too, but we'd take a fresh look at it and just start from a discrete generational approach to begin with and not assume that we could do a continuous time model and then generalize the results to a discrete generation. But I'm going to start off with an ex the extreme example I was talking about. So our problem is now going to be a cube, 400 centimeters on a side, with reflecting boundary conditions. We're starting with the right answer, the uniform source distribution. We're going to run 1,000 neutrons per generation for 10,000 generations. So you can see here these pink dots are the 1,000 starting locations for the, at the beginning of generation number one. That was our initial uniform source guess. After 1,000 generations, the neutrons are all in this blue blob right here. We've given it the right answer, and it's managed to converge to something that's clearly not the right answer. We'll, we'll let it run for another 9,000 generations. 
things don't get much better. The blob is still there, it's just moved and deformed a little bit, bit, but they haven't spread out to fill up the whole space and they're not going to. What was even more interesting is that we figured out that all the neutrons, starting with generation 942, are in some sense descended from this single neutron in the 1,000 starting neutrons in generation one. And I'll explain in the next si slides what I mean by being descended from that one. So we have two related questions we wanted to answer. Why do all the neutrons in later generations descend from just one neutron in the initial source gas? And why do the neutrons form a cluster rather than distribute themselves uniformly throughout the problem? So to address question one, we used uh, mathematics from the field of population genetics. And I've listed the four most uh, important documents that we drew from. And then to address question two, we use methods developed for computational ecology and similar fields. Um, and I've listed two here from Physical Review E that we drew on fairly heavily. So now I'm going to explain some, uh, genet uh, some terminology. And instead of reinventing the terminology, we just decided to use the same terminology used by the population geneticists. And we're, we're going to apply it to simulated neutrons. So this is a cartoon of the evolution of five simulated neutrons through 15 generations. So the positions here don't mean anything. They're just, we're just, it's, uh, just a way of representing neutron one, two, three, four, and five. Um, and we're going to define a parent-child relationship such that a neutron that produces other neutrons by fission is the parent to the children so produced. And we're going to indicate that relation in this cartoon by these black lines. So poor neutrons one and two didn't have any children. Uh, neutron three had two, neutron four had two, and neutron five had one in the first generation. Um, we're going to define a family as all the neutrons that trace their lineage through this parent-child relationship to the same original ancestor belonging to the same family. So these five neutrons are the original ancestors. They're the one that start the problem. Um, so these two have a family size of one. Neutron number three in the first generation gave rise to a family size of three. Neutron four, family size of six. And neutron five had a huge family. Um, another important term that we're going to come across is the most recent common ancestor. And that is just the most re recent ancestor shared by some subset of the neutrons in a given generation. So for sibling neutrons, their most recent common ancestor is their parent. So here we have three neutrons that are all related and there's their parents, so obviously that's their most recent common ancestor. Um, there, here's a more complicated case. Just consider this pair of neutrons. Uh, they, don't have, they don't share the same parent, but if you trace their lineage back through the generations until they join up, we find there their most recent common ancestor. And this is going to be a very important concept in what follows. And clearly, neutrons from different families don't have the most frequent and common ancestor because they'll track, trace their lineage all the way back to generation one. And because they're in different families, that'll be two different neutrons. and They can't be the same. OK, so what is population genetics? It's the, um, it's the study of the genetic makeup of populations of individuals. And given an in initial distribution of alleles, the genetic makeup, it studies how that distribution evolves in time. And over the course of the decades, um, various simplified models have been developed to let the population geneticists do some analysis of how this could happen. Uh, the very simplest and earliest model is called the Wright-Fisher model. Uh, it has several simplifying assumptions. Uh, one is the population size is constant. We know in real populations, individuals, the population size can fluctuate up and down. 
Uh, generations don't overlap in time. Clearly, that's an approximation because in real life, generations of individuals do overlap in time. Uh, the parent is chosen randomly with a replacement from all members of the preceding generation. There's no natural selection, mutation, or recombination. So all these things that make this a very simplifying assumption for a real population of biological entities make it exact for our study in our population of neutrons in Monte Carlo. So there are a couple proofs that arise from the Wright-Fisher model. Uh, one is that eventually every member of the population has the same allele. That might sound a little bit familiar. Every member of the population at some point in time is descended from the same parent. Uh, the probability that a particular allele will become the surviving one at some point in the future is proportional to its fraction of the population at the present time. For, for us, what that means is if we start out with n families or 1,000 families, the probability that eventually the family that's left is equally likely to be in, related to any one of those 1,000 starting neutrons. All right, so the, the proof that the uh, mathematicians that looked at this problem came up with pretty complicated, but uh, I will give an intuitive proof of what we call fixation, uh, which is the probability, the, the, the fact that eventually all the alleles will be the same in the population, which for us, our application means all the neutrons and at some point in time will be descended from the same original ancestor. So at any generation, there's a finite probability that no neutrons in the family will produce children. So that family will go extinct. It could be a very small probability, but if you run enough generations, it'll happen. So the bottom line is the number of families cannot increase from one generation to the next. It can only decrease or stay the same. But uh, it can't stay the same in indefinitely because there is this non-zero probability uh, per generation that a family will go extinct. Eventually, one by one, families will go extinct. However, they can't go all the way down to zero number of families because we have a fixed number of neutrons per generation. So the only possible outcome is for the number of families to decrease until there's just one family of n neutrons. Um, so he here's a a cartoon, here's the point, generation number 10, where all the neutrons come from the same ancestor. You track these green lines back, and this is the most recent common ancestor of the neutrons that at the instant of fixation. So the fixation occurred at generation 10, 9, 8, 7. So they shared a common ancestor at generation 6, and then you can track that one back to find that all these neutrons from generation 10 forward um, started with, uh, are related to uh, neutron number three in the original um, generation. So um, coalescent theory is another technique from population genetics that can be used can be applied to any of the models of population genetics, but here we're going to apply it to the Wright-Fisher model. Uh, one thing that it can, uh, uh, one result is that it can calculate the expected number of generations to the most recent common ancestor for n, lowercase n neutron in a generation consisting of uppercase n neutrons. Uh, so there's two useful cases that, we're, that we will need. One is when we make little n the same as big N, that gives us the expected number of generations to fixation. And then another one that you'll see the importance of later is when N is equal to 2. So that's the expected number of generations separating a pair of neutrons in a given generation from their most recent common ancestor, and that's N. Uh, up here, this was uh, 2N times this quantity that's essentially 1 for N sufficiently large. So 2N generations to fixation and n generations separating a pair of neutrons from its mo their most recent common ancestor. Okay, um, this next bit of work here I'm going to talk about is 
primarily done by my, my co-author. Um, she said, forget about these approximate models. We've only got 1,000 neutrons per generation for our toy problem. We can analyze that exactly. So she did it as follows. She created a vector of length n plus 1. So in our case, that'd be 1,001. Uh, the first element is uh, the expected number of families with population of 0. The second element is special, expected number of families with population 1 and so forth at generation g. So then she defined this transition matrix. It's a way to go from generation G to G plus 1. And she was able to derive an expression for that um, just using basic statistics. And arrived with, then, with this equation where if you have this equation for the expected number of families of each size at generation G, you can get the expected number of families of each size at the next generation, G plus 1. And she got the idea from this, from this, this paper here, um, from computation like ecology. And here's the results of applying that to our toy problem of 1,000 neutrons. Uh, we'll look at three special cases first. One is uh, family size of 0. Uh, initially, that's 0, because we, in first generation, all the families are of size 1 by definition. Um, the blue dot and the red dot overlap here. So the next blue dot is here. So we, at, even after just one generation, uh, we now have maybe 40% of the families of size 1. And this number then just monotonically increases, asymptotically approaching 999. We look at the population uh, size 1, number, expected number of families, population size 1. That starts off at 1,000 and decreases immediately to a number around you know, 400 and then monotonically, asymptotically approaches 0. Now we'll look at the population, expected number of families of population size 1,000. That's the orange line here. It starts off at 0 and then asymptotically approaches 1. For all other pop family sizes, they, it starts at 0, peaks, and then asymptotically approaches 0. The graphs on the right side are just a different way of looking at the same data. And in the interest of time, we'll skip that. So uh, using her uh, technique here, we can do an exact calculation of the probability of fixation per generation. So if we look at the last element of that vector, the n plus first element, that's the expected number of families of size n at generation g. So that's the expected number, so that's a, the same as the probability that there's just one family of size n at generation g, because this is the number between 0 and 1, uh, which means that it's the probability of fixation happening at or before generation G. So if we just take the difference between this quantity for generation G plus 1 and generation G, that's the probability that fixation occurs exactly during generation G. That it didn't occur before, doesn't occur after, it occurs at generation G. You plot that and you get this hump graph here. Uh, recall that the expected value of the number of uh, generations of fixation is 2 times n. So for our toy problem, that would be 2,000. So the most probable value is less than the average value just because its tail is so long. <clears throat> OK, so we wanted to check this to make sure that we're not just fooling ourselves. So we used the exact method to calculate the, for our toy problem, the expected number of generations to uh, fixation, and we get 1,996. We're also able to calculate the standard deviation of that value, we've got 1,076. Uh, recall the Wright-Fisher model gave us 1,998. The Wright-Fisher model also gives a, an expression for the standard deviation, 1,077, so very good agreement with the exact theory. Uh, but just to do an, an additional test, we ran 200 independent Monte Carlo si simulations. 
we calculated the, for each one, we calculated the number of families left as a function of generation, and we averaged those 200 calculations, you know, average over all 200 calculations to um, get the number of, average number of families remaining as a function of generation number. Uh, the gray line here is the exact theory, or the red dots are the exact theory. The gray line is the Monte Carlo average for the 200 calculations, and just they lay right on top of one another. So I gave us confidence that we were uh, taking the right approach here. Now, uh, down here, I've just reproduced the red dots, again, the, the uh, exact theory. But superimposed on that, I have a, a green line labeled run one. And that run one is one out of the 200 calculations, but it happens to be the one that produced that single cluster that I showed in the previous slide. And you can see right here, at generation 942, the number of families drops from two to one. So that's where fixation occurred in that one particular calculation. All right, so we've talked about now uh, why, the answer to the first question, why do all the neutrons eventually become descended from a single neutron in the first generation? Now we're gonna look at the second question as to why they form a cluster as opposed to spreading out throughout the problem space. And to do that, we're going to use a, the concept called the two-particle distribution function, which is just at uh, generation G, it's the joint probability density for one neutron being in unit volume about X and another being in unit volume about Y when it's absorbed. A different one, I should say, being at, at, in per unit volume about Y when it's absorbed. We're going to use that to study pairs of neutrons. Uh, so if they're n neutrons in the problem, they're n times n minus one over two distinct pairs. So we're gonna calculate, count pair one, two is the same as, as being the same pair as pair two, one. That's why this factor of two in the denominator. Um, initially, all the pairs are uncorrelated because they were independently sampled from a uniform distribution. At each generation, some pairs are created that are correlated because the members of the pair share a common parent. So over the course of the calculation, we're gonna get more and more shared or uh, correlated pairs and fewer and fewer uncorrelated pairs because once we've gotten rid of an uncorrelated pair, we can never get it back. Um, and just you know, using the binomial distribution, we can show that uh, at each generation, a, a fraction one over n of the total pairs are newly correlated. Some of those newly correlated pairs take the place of uncorrelated pairs. Some of them take the place of other correlated pairs. Now, again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of hustle through this part, um, actually the next few slides. But the approach we took was to divide the two particle correlation function into two components one due to uncorrelated pairs, and one due to correlated pairs. Uh, we define this quantity as the expected fraction of uncorrelated pairs. You can see that is a de decreasing function of generation number. And we can calculate the two particle distribution function for uncorrelated pairs exactly. So this is just the, the uncorrelated contribution to the two particle distribution function. So it starts off at this value and then decreases with this value here until it uh, asymptotically approaches zero. This quantity is the expected fraction uh, of pairs in generation G with a most recent common ancestor in an earlier generation G prime. We use that to define or to calculate the correlated part of the two particle correlation function. So we have a, a sum here over all generations prior to the current generation of interest. So because of this summation, the contribution of the uncorrelated pairs just becomes bigger and bigger until it becomes, the total contribution of uncorrelated pairs is 100% of all the pairs. What we need to proceed though in calculating the, this part of the two particle correlation function are these Green's functions. So G of X and R of G minus G prime, 
is the probability per unit volume that a neutron will be absorbed in X given that its ancestor in G prime was absorbed at position R. So what, we, what each term here means, that's some term G prime in the summation here, is that generation G prime prior to generation G, uh, a pair of uh, neutrons were, were created from the same parent and that parent existed at location R. Over the course of the subsequent G minus G prime um, generations, one of those neutrons wound up at location X and the other one wound up at location Y. And that's all I'll say about that. There was a lot of, but I'll give you the final result later on. Um, to proceed, we, we have to calculate the, these Green's functions. And the actual calculation, as I mentioned, was, was very hairy and I'll skip it. Um, but we'll, let's just consider, so you'll have some concept of how this is done, as um, we'll look at the case for an infinite medium and then I'll just present the result for our finite box, our cube. Um, so we define, and here again we're taking advantage of some tricks that we learned from our uh, colleagues in computational ecology. We define a pseudoparticle as the actual neutron in generation G and its ancestor in each of the preceding G minus one generations back to the beginning of the problem. So if you look at the absorption location of the neutron that, neutrons that, can, that make up this pseudoparticle, they'll form a trajectory in space. And we're going to make the assumption that the trajectory of that pseudoparticle obeys the diffusion law, that it's essentially Brownian motion. Uh, in that case, it, the Green's function is just the, you know, satisfies a, a time-dependent diffusion equation where instead of continuous time, we have this discrete time G and instead of explicitly writing a diffusion coefficient, we cast it in terms of this quantity here, R1 squared average, which is just the mean squared distance that a neutron travels between its birth and fission and it's death by absorption within a single generation. For our toy problem, this came out to be about five squared centimeters. This is the migration area for those of you who are reactor physics types. So, as I mentioned, I won't go into the derivation of the Green's function for finite medium, but we borrowed heavily from our colleagues in computational ecology once again. And uh, you can see it depends on that same term R sub one squared average. And I'll just proceed. So the two particle distribution function is kind of unwieldy to deal with. So we were looking for a single metric that might characterize the population uh, instead of the, this function of two variables. So we, cal we use the single particle, the two particle distribution function to calculate the mean squared distance between pairs of neutrons. And we'll denote that by R sub P squared as a function of the generation number. So that's just uh, the two particle distribution function times the absolute squared displacement between two points in the two particle distribution function, average over all possible values of X and Y, and then divided by a normalization factor here. So we know for a uniform distribution uh, of neutrons, the mean squared distance between pairs is L squared over two. So if we see a value significantly smaller than that, it would be an indication the clustering's going on. So what we did was we ran, um, again, 200 Monte Carlo runs. For each one, we calculated the mean squared distance between pairs, the function of generation, and then we averaged over all 200 calculations. On this graph here, the black line is the result of our theory. The red line is the average of the Monte Carlo calculation. So you can see the agreement's really good. Um, the green line is, again, that run number one that I mentioned that led to the diagram that I showed you earlier on. And here at generation 942, we see this precipitous drop in the mean squared distance between pairs. Uh, so what this indicates is that there is a connection between the extinction of families. This is where we went from having two families to one family 
and the collapse of the population into a single little cluster. What we hypothesize is happening at this point is we had two families, we had two clusters that were widely separated. So the mean square distance between pairs had a component due to the uh, mean square distance between pairs, one cluster, component due to the mean square distance between pairs and the other, and then a component due to the mean square distance between pairs that had one member in one cluster and one member in the other cluster. When one, cl the, one of the two clusters disappeared, when the family, that family went extinct, we dro dropped down to just uh, having one family, one cluster, and the n uh, mean square distance between pairs just dropped down by orders of magnitude. All right, um, so the exact expression uh, of the mean square distance between pairs for, for generations quite uh, too big to fit on a single slide, actually. But we can take the, the interesting limit as the number of generations goes to infinity, and we get this result right here. So we're going to look at a few limiting cases. One, the limiting case as the size of the box becomes large. In that case, the um, Density of, excuse me, density of neutrons becomes low, and we get this result here. Now, recall from earlier on that um, I, I said that uh, from the um, Wright-Fisher theory, the mean number of generations in the past between two neutrons in the current generation and their most recent common ancestor is the number of neutrons in a generation n. So uh, r sub 1 squared average is the mean number of uh, mean distance traveled by a neutron within a generation. n times that is the mean number or mean squared distance traveled by a neutron that shared uh, a, an ancestor in generations in the past from the time of that shared ancestor. Because these are mean squared distance this mean square distance add linearly. Uh, so two times that is the mean squared separation between new, two neutrons that had a mean square, that had a um, common ancestor, the average number of generations in the past. So over here, I've plotted the cluster at 10,000 generations. The magenta dot there is the center of mass of that cluster. And the radius here of this ball is the square root of this number. So this quantity is a, is a good representation of the size, expected size of a cluster when, when this behavior occurs. Now we'll look at another limit, and that is the box size stays fixed, but we let the number of neutrons become infinite, infinite. So in this case, the result, this complicated result here, just reduces to the result for uncorrelated pairs of neutrons. For an intermediate case where n is large but not infinite, um, this quantity here is positive, so 1 minus this is a number slightly less than 1. This is the uncorrelated value. So we get a mean square distance between pairs that's smaller than the right value, but maybe only by a little bit. And this is probably the situation that people are in when they see this evidence of the clumpiness that I talked about earlier. So, um, conclusions here. Uh, I'm going to take this a little bit out of order. So, the problem I illustrated on the previous slide and earlier slides was an extreme case uh, where all the neutrons collapse down to a single cluster. Um, I want to show you a more typical case, maybe, and that would be we run the same problem, but we'll Instead of the um, cube being 400 centimeters on a side, we'll make it 40 centimeters on a side. So it's one one thousandth of the volume of the original problem. So we run the same number of neutrons in that smaller volume, and we run them for 500 generations. And after 500 generations, it turns out there were four families left. And I've color coded them here, blue, green, red, and black. And if you looked at any one of those families alone, it would appear to form maybe some kind of a, a cluster, not as tight of a little cluster as in the, the uh, when I had 400 centimeters on a side cube. Uh, 
But like so you can see, the blue ones are all kind of down here. The black ones are up here. But then when you take these four independent clusters, because they all came from a different original ancestor, they have no influence one on the other, and superimpose them on one another, you get something that looks a little bit like it might be uniform, but not quite. You know, it's a little funny. Uh, and again, we think this is the sort of thing that's happening when people who run real Monte Carlo calculations see the, the clumpiness that, that we discussed earlier. Uh, okay, um, now let's take another look at that 400 centimeter cube um, and run with the same number of total histories as before, same no, tumor, no, total number of neutrons, but instead of running a thousand batch, a thousand generations of 10,000 neutrons, a thousand generation, 10,000 generations of a thousand neutrons, we'll run 250 generations of 40,000 neutrons. So same total number of neutrons run, but for far fewer generations and far more neutrons per generation. So remember before, when the original problem when we run 1,000 neutrons per generation, the expected um, number of generations of fixation was 2,000 and we ran for 10,000. So it was very likely that we were going to experience fixation. In this calculation, the expected number of generations to fixation is 80,000, and we're only running 250,000. So it's very unlikely that we would have fixation in this calculation. There's probably still a lot of families that have disappeared uh, by generation 250, but we still have a lot left. So we have two things going on. One, we have a lot more families left at the end of the calculation, plus the density of neutrons is higher, so we're following an equation more like this for the mean square distance between pairs than like this. So for re just rerun the problem in a different way, you don't see any evidence of clustering at all. And so I mentioned early on that for this analysis I used the toy Monte Carlo code uh, because I, I could get an analytical solution for that and I couldn't with a real Monte Carlo code. But we, I ran the same problem using MC21, which is our production code. Uh, ran for a thousand generations, a thousand neutrons, and at the end of those thousand generations, it, in this code, non-analog Monte Carlo, it uses survival biasing. It doesn't use the uh, algorithm where you choose a fission site and then re put it back in the pool for the next neutron. It minimizes the reuse of fission source sites. And still, at the end of a thousand generations, we got three families left, three distinct clusters. Um, and so this can happen with the real Monte Carlo code. And if you don't believe me, just talk to the, our colleagues at Oak Ridge. They can tell you about their bad experiences. Okay. And uh, so now it's, uh, I want to thank my co-author, Anya Mittel, for doing much of the work, Professor Zoya, at uh, CEA in France for a lot of suggestions, and then Professor Osborne and Professor Chasu for providing me with the uh, mathematical techniques I needed to solve this problem. And with that, I'll take questions.